All right, guys, we're going to start reading The Pig Man. So I need you to open up your book, and I want you to find this page at the beginning. It's called The Oath, all right? And follow along as I read it to you. It's The Oath. Being of sound mind and body on this 15th day of April in our sophomore year at Franklin High School, let it be known that Lorraine Jensen and John Conlon have decided to record the facts, and only the facts, about our experiences with Mr. Angelo Pignati. Miss Ryland, the cricket, is watching us at every moment because she is the librarian at Franklin High and thinks we're using her typewriter to copy a book report for our retarded English teacher. The truth and nothing but the truth until this memorial epic is finished, so help us God. So this is an older book, and it's a little more mature, but it's a seventh grade reader. Um, so what I'm saying to you is you might hear words that we don't use anymore, um, there might be things said in this in this book um, that are a little more mature, but I think that you guys can handle it because you are seventh graders, okay? If you have a problem, let me know, all right? So, go to chapter one. Now, I don't like school, which you might say is one of the factors that got us involved with this old guy we nicknamed Pigman. Actually, I hate school. But then again, most of the time, I hate everything. I used to really hate school when I first started at Franklin High. I hated it so much, the first year they called me the bathroom bomber. Other kids got elected GO president and class secretary and lab squad captain, but I got elected the bathroom bomber. They called me that because I used to set off bombs in the bathroom. I set off 23 bombs before I didn't feel like doing it anymore. The reason I never got caught was because I used to take a tin can, that's a firecracker, as if you didn't know, and mold a piece of clay around it so that it'd hold a candle attached to the fuse. One of those skinny little birthday candles? Then I'd light the thing, and it'd take about eight minutes before the fuse got lit. I always put the bombs in the first floor boy's john, right before one of the porcelain unmentionables, where nobody could see it. Then I'd go off to my next class. No matter where I was in the building, I could hear the blast. If I got all involved, I'd forget I had lit the bomb. And then, even if I'd been, I'd be surprised when it went off. And then, even then, I'd be surprised if it went off. Sorry about that, guys. Of course, I was never as surprised as the poor guys who were in the boys' john on the first floor sneaking a cigarette, because the boys' john is right next to the dean's office, and a whole flock of Gestapo would race in there and blame them. Sure, they didn't do it, but it's pretty hard to say you're innocent when you're caught with a lung full of rich, mellow tobacco smoke. When the dean catches you smoking, it really makes you uh, maybe hazardous to your health. I smoke one with a recessed filter myself. After my bomb avocation, I became the organizer of the super colossal fruit roll. You could only do this on Wednesdays because that was the only day they sold old apples in the cafeteria. Sick, undernourished, antique apples. They sold old oranges on Fridays, but they weren't as good because they don't make much noise when you roll them. But on Wednesdays, when I knew there was going to be a substitute teacher in one of my classes, I passed the word at lunch, and all the kids in that class would buy these scrawny apples. Then we'd take them to class and wait for the right moment. Like when the substitute was writing on the blackboard. You couldn't depend on a substitute to write on the blackboard, though, because... Usually, they just told you to take a study period so they didn't have to do any work and could just sit at the desk reading the New York Times. But you could depend on the substitute to be mildly retarded, so I'd pick out the right moment and clear my throat quite loudly, which was a signal for everyone to get the apples out. Then I gave the phony sneeze that meant to hold them down near the floor. When I whistled, that was a signal to roll them. Did you ever hear a herd of buffalo stampeding? Thirty-four scrawny, undernourished apples rolling up the aisles sound just like a herd of buffalo stampeding. Every one of the fruit rolls was successful, except for the time we had a re retired postman for General Science 1H5. We were supposed to study incandescent lamps, but he spent the period telling us about commemorative stamps. He was so enthusiastic about the old days at the P.O., I just didn't have the heart to give, all, give the signals and the kids were a little put out because they all got stuck with old apples. But I gave up all that kid stuff now that I'm a sophomore. The only thing I do now that is faintly criminal is write on desks. Like, right this minute, 
I feel like writing something on this nice polished table here. And since the cricket is down at the other end of the library, showing some four-eyed dimwit how to use the encyclopedias, I'm going to do it. Help me, a rotten science teacher has given me a drug to change me into a tiny, teeny mosquito. Please help me, help, help. Now that I've artistically expressed myself, we might as well get this cursing thing over with too. I was a little annoyed at first, since I was the one who suggested writing this thing because I couldn't stand the miserable look on Lorraine's face ever since the pig man died. She looked a little bit like a St. Bernard that just lost its keg, but since she agreed to work on this, she's gotten a little livelier and more op uh, opinionated. One of her opinions is that I shouldn't curse. Not in a memorial epic. Let's face it, I said, everyone curses. She finally said I could curse if it was excruciatingly necessary by going like this, ampersand, hashtag, dollar sign, percent sign. Now, that isn't too bad an idea because ampersand, <laughs> hashtag, dollar sign, percent sign, leaves it to the imagination, and most people have a worse imagination than I have. So I figure I'll go like ampersand, uh, hashtag, dollar sign, percent sign, if it's a mild curse, like the kind you hear in movies when everyone makes believe they're morally violated but really have gotten the thrill of a lifetime. If it's going to be a revolting curse, I'll just put a three in front of it, like three ampersand, uh, hashtag, dollar sign, percent sign, and then you'll know it's the raunchiest curse you can think of. Just now, I better explain why we call Miss Ryland the cricket. Like I told you, she's the librarian at Franklin and is letting us type this thing on her quiet typewriter, which isn't quiet at all. But there aren't many kids in seventh period study because most of them cut it and others get excused early because our school is overcrowded. It's only kids like Lorraine and me that get stuck with seventh period study because we have to st stay around for an eighth period class called Problems in American Democracy. And if you think having problems in American democracy is a fun way to end the day, you need a snug fitting straitjacket. Anyway, Miss Ryland is a little on the fat side, but that doesn't stop her from wearing these tight skirts which make her nylon stockings rub together when she walks so she makes the scratchiest sound. That's why the kids call her the cricket. If she uh, taught woodshop or gym, nobody really knows she makes that sound. But she's the librarian, and so it's quiet. You can hear every move she makes. Lorraine is panting to get at the typewriter now, so I'm going to let her before she has a heart attack. That's chapter one.